Well, I can shout order, order. <laughs> My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to this lecture of the, by the on behalf of the Archives and History Society, all party history group of the House, Houses of Parliament. And it does give me great pleasure, and it isn't just words when I say this, to welcome Jill Liddington to talk to us today. And I'm so for, looking forward to that. I've known Jill, well, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to, yeah, a long time, but I see she's got things about reflecting over four decades, and it might be about right, it might be about right, Jill. And um, I've always, when I read her first book, which she wrote with Jill Norris, um, One Hand Behind it, Us, it just caught my imagination. I thought it was brilliantly researched, it was wonderfully written, and I learned so much. And what I read in 1978 has actually been consistent through all uh, Jill's other books. And when I was doing my hi there, the latest one on Victor Grayson, I suddenly realized I really had to talk about the suffragettes. And I got in contact with Jill again. I sometimes feel in the modern world, we perhaps center on individuals and the whole story centers on those individuals and I'm thinking perhaps of the Pankhurst families who were absolutely brilliant you know all four of them um, but it was more than the Pankhurst as I'm sure Jill is going to tell us today but they were all very brave women so Jill is here today, We're good. she's going to talk for somewhere around a little bit in excess of half an hour and then she'll deal with questions. So I'm really looking forward to this and I know I'm not going to be disappointed and neither are you. So Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you for those very, very kind remarks, David, and thanks very much to John for uh, organising today and uh, stepping into the technical breach at the last minute. Thank you. Uh, as David said, I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes, so we'll then have ample time for questions and discussion, because you never talk about votes for women without a lot of controversy and people wanting to uh, ask questions. So our title is... What do women do in archives? Um, and one response might be, well, they do just the same as everybody else, don't they? They go in and they look at stuff. But perhaps it's not quite so simple, because I'm just going to focus for a moment on the people who go into archives to do historical research who are historians. Who are they? Well, the Royal Historical Society um, recently did a survey called um, Gender Equality, and they looked at the percentages, male and female, both uh, A-level students, undergraduate students, history academics, and then professors. And every time you went up a step, the, the proportion of women went down. A-level is 52% female, professors of history is 21%. So probably the people going into archives as professional paid historians traditionally were more likely to be men. But the second part of the question is how well are women represented in the archives? And here this evening we're going to focus on votes for women. Um, so looking at what sort of suffrage holdings there are in the archives and also looking at what's changed over the last four decades. And I'm going to suggest really quite a lot. So let's start off with film. Who's seen the film Suffragette? Oh, pr practically a majority. Um, I'll come back to um, the, that film uh, towards the end. Anyone mature enough to remember watching Shoulder to Shoulder on television in 1974? No, no, that's pushing. <laughs> Here is Shoulder to Shoulder, spring 1974. Unlike the suffragette film, it was a documentary drama on the small screen, and it's essentially told, as David suggested, the story of the Pankhurst, about Emmeline Pankhurst's founding of the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, in her Manchester home in 1903, and then the mushrooming of the suffragette movement, and here is obviously some procession, uh, probably in London. 
And Shoulder to Shoulder in spring 1974 is where I started over 40 years ago. And I sat in um, the London flat I was living in, watching this on television, completely mesmerised, completely hooked. What I remember most clearly, most vividly, is Sylvia Pankhurst uh, in prison, uh, refusing prison food, hunger striking, and forcible feeding. It, it was such a horrible sight to see, and we hadn't seen it before. Then a few months later, I moved up to Manchester area and went to live in Oldham, which is just off the edge of the map. I'm living just about in that, that corner there. And uh, what I uh, was soon wondering was, who else besides the Pankhursts in the Manchester area? I began reading, I began reading, uh, you start with Sylvia Pankhurst's 1931 history, the suffragette history, and before long, I, I met with Jill Norris, who lived in Manchester, and she shared my sharp curiosity about who else besides the Pankhursts. And we were soon on the track of other Manchester campaigners. But unlike the Pankhurst account, there seemed to be very, very little uh, published about Manchester's amazing suffrage pioneers. And one woman we found out about was called Esther Roper. And uh, we now know that she was a working class woman who quite extraordinarily got to Manchester University. Uh, which is so rare then. She became, in 1893, the secretary of the great Manchester Suffrage Society. So this was her, um, her, her area of uh, operation. And she was soon joined in Manchester um, by uh, that amazing Irish fantasy act poet called Eva Booth, and they became life partners. Jill and I needed to find out more about Esther Roper, Eva Gorbooth, who they worked with, how they campaigned. So our first port of call was, of course, to go into St. Peter's Square. Anyone here not been to Manchester? <laughs> Nobody's admitting it. Um, into the magnificent, Manchester's magnificent central library and the archives there um, to find out about what these women actually did. Um, and we're lucky because Manchester Central Library has a wonderful women's suffrage collection. Um, and for any archivists here? Yep. Oh, <laughs> lots, lots. So if I rattle off the numbers, you'll feel at home. It's M50 forward stroke 1 stroke 1 to 18. Uh, <laughs> um, and those, that suffrage collection, women's suffrage collection in this building contains, the, for example, the annual reports of the North of England Society for Women's Suffrage, based in Manchester, uh, organised, run then by Esther Roper, and who was then working with the cotton workers. And I just want to take one sample uh, document, if I may. If it is necessary, as the men say it is, for men to be directly represented in Parliament, how much more necessary must, be, must it be to women, the only entirely unrepresented workers, to have the protection and power of a vote? The women's best chance of winning their own enfranchisement, winning the vote, is through the cotton trade unions of the North. Here they have the power because they are more numerous than men. So, that was Esther Roper uh, and her leaflet, 1902, The Cotton Trade Unions and the Enfranchisement of Women. So what we found, Jill Norris and I, is although we were doing the research in Manchester, and that's necessarily where you start, we needed to look at uh, a rather uh, at the cotton towns slightly far, further north, and what we soon f found out that was by 1900, there were no fewer than quarter of a million women working in the cotton mills of Lancashire. They were mainly working in the uh, cotton weaving towns of here: Preston, Blackburn, Burnley and then Nelson. Manchester's down here, so these are the cotton towns, weaving towns north of Rochdale. And here, in the cotton weaving sheds, the majority of weavers were women. They earned, and this is new money, one pound five p, and the men earned one pound twenty-five p. So for Edwardian, or late Victorian Edwardian England, it was as near as you can get to equal pay for working women. 
and they got that equal pay or they received that equal pay because they were well-organised working-class women, well-organised into trade unions, most particularly the Cotton Weavers Union, and they were articulate, and yet they all remained disenfranchised. Not a single one of them had the vote. So Esther Roper and Eva Gilbooth decided to do something about it, and in Blackburn, where you can see, on May Day 1900, they decided to launch a women cotton workers textile petition. Within about nine months, by spring 1900, 1901, they had over 29,000 signatures. And in March that year, 15 women cotton workers took the heavy roll of signatures uh, down to London, down to Westminster, down to this building, uh, with Esther Roper quietly accompanying them. And it was presented to the House of Commons looking by, like a giant garden roller. And thanks to Mari sitting here, we can now uh, see uh, what that uh, looked like. Well, just in case it looks a bit blurry, I'll read some of it out. So this is a list of public petitions to Parliament in March 1901, Parliamentary Franchise, the Extension to Women. And first it's Bristol, 20 women, then it's Hastings, 12 women, then it's the Labour Church in Bolton, that's 31 women, then somewhere else, Cheltenham, 300 women, Manchester, 23 women, Birmingham, 90, and then suddenly, women workers in the cotton factories of Lancashire, 29,197. It kind of puts everything else into just penny numbers. So it was an amazing achievement. Um, it was something like one woman cotton worker in 10. I mean, an extraordinary achievement. If any of us have gone out in the rain and asked for signatures, we know what, what that means, how much work that means. So the petition was uh, presented and it was accepted by the MPs. But what did these well-meaning MPs do? Did they actually do anything? Well, Esther Roper, Eva Gilbooth, and the women cotton workers thought not. Nothing was happening. And so in 1903, and this is shortly before Emmeline Pankhurst formed the WSPU in her home in Manchester, they formed the Lancashire Women Textile Workers Representation Committee. And in 1906, they went on a delegation to the Prime Minister, um, then Campbell Bannerman, here we can see Eva Gorbooth, she's got glasses on, other women textile workers. They're all very much re uh, valuing their respectability. There's ever, virtually everybody wearing a hat. And we're going to be looking at Selena Cooper from Nelson in a minute. So that was their delegation down to the Prime Minister, who nodded um, helpfully um, and then... I was going to say fell ill, that sounds a bit cynical, but <laughs> didn't last much longer and was followed by a much less uh, sympathetic MP, uh, MP as Prime Minister, Asquith of whom more later. So we, here we have their deputation to the then Prime Minister. And by this stage, uh, Jill Norris and I were being able to do archival research, but also oral history research, interviews with some of the last surviving elderly daughters of the women we came to call the radical suffragists, daughters of people like Selina Cooper of Nelson. We call them the radical suffragists. We started to write articles. Our articles began to bulge, bulged into a book, and we approached a small new feminist publisher who said yes to our proposal. And this is probably the, the is cover that, uh, <laughs> that David remembers. And it did cause quite a stir. It got some wonderfully enthusiastic reviews. It got onto and remained onto history students' reading lists. But it also caused some controversy because people, members of the public, history students, had just been watching Shoulder to Shoulder only four years earlier. And they thought, but we know about the Pankhurst. What's all this stuff? Um, and they couldn't quite believe that Jill Norris and I weren't making it up or exaggerating. So I determined to focus on one of the radical suffragists, uh, Selina Cooper, and to write a biography of her. And perhaps we can go back to um, the slide before and there. Just hold it for a moment um, while we talk about Selina 
uh, Cooper. Because Selena Cooper is uh, interesting. She'd worked, she'd left full-time school age 12 to become a half-timer in one of the cotton mills near Nelson, then becoming a winder, preparing the thread, wo woven thread, ready for the um, spinners, uh, ready for the, the weavers. And she was perhaps the most uh, impressive of the radical suffragists. She was on the 1901 uh, delegation uh, to Parliament with the petition, and she was, as we can see, on the 1906 deputation to the Prime Minister. She was an excellent speaker, a real orator, even though she'd had to leave full-time school so early and didn't have all the writing skills that her better-educated sisters might have had. But she was an excellent uh, speaker. And... Uh, Jill Norris and I had already interviewed her in uh, March 1976, again June 1976, because she had this fount of stories, and again in 1977. And I now went back uh, to visit her again. Um, this is around uh, 1980, um, and she's in her 80s. And she was willing to share with me her mother's rich cache of documents that they'd lived in the same house how many of us can say this of our family, since 1901? In the same house. I was visiting the house that her mother, um, at Mary, had lived in since the age of one, and everything had been uh, saved. And I was very happy to take walk-ups at Mary Street with these bulging carrier bags of wonderful letters from Keir Hardy or Ramsay MacDonald or wonderful photographs and work with the archivists at Preston, the Lancashire County Record Office, to deposit them. So, uh, competent, impressive, charismatic uh, Selina Cooper was headhunted by the giant suffragist organisation, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, who, unlike the militants, the pankers who used militant tactics, they stuck to constitutional tactics. They were law-abiding. And from 1906 to 1914, i.e. for the eight years before the war broke out, Selina Cooper worked as a paid organiser uh, for the National Union. And here she is in Liverpool, in Kirkdale, in 1910. She's sitting there in the car. Obviously, somebody from the National Union in Liverpool uh, could aff afford a car, ran a car. And she's um, posed in front of the suffrage shop, law-abiding Mrs. Fawcett, the leader of the Constitutionalists. And there making sure that at this by-election in Kirkdale, in Liverpool, that all the uh, electors, all male, and roughly two-thirds of adult men then, uh, would not ignore the fact that women hadn't got the vote and wanted it. Let's look at one more photograph. The following year, and um, this is one of my favourite ones, that the local suffrage society from Clitheroe, which was the name of the constituency, here, go down to London for a procession, and here they are standing on their Nelson station. Uh, here's Selina Cooper in her very best dress and best hat. Here's Mary, the daughter, aged 11, uh, wearing her suffragist sash. And here's the, uh, her father, husband, Selina's husband, Robert, a weaver, carrying the um, banner for the, um, for the society. And in the next and final uh, slide we'll look at from Selina Cooper, um, this is, I chose because it's uh, a different subject, it's Maternity and Child Welfare Week in Accrington, quite near Nelson. It's wartime, it's 1915, so it reminds us that people like the radical suffragists campaigned when they could on other subjects near to their heart, maternity and child welfare. They worked with other organisations, um, the Women's Cooperative Guild. They worked with other people. Here's Margaret Bonfield, who we'll see as a cabinet minister in the interwar uh, Labour government. Um, and they continued in this way um, into, into the war and afterwards. And again, I was delighted uh, when I approached Virago that they accepted my biography proposal. And they were prepared to design the cover as a sort of NUS... NUWSS themed cover in red and green and white because we see so much of purple, green and white, don't we? And so many of the campaigners were in fact suffragists for whom uh, red, green and white were the colours. Um, and these photographs and archives are all deposited 
uh, in Lancashire archives. So that was 1984, and I stopped. I felt I'd given one suffrage talk too many, and I felt I was just getting a bit to sound like a bit like a record, and I turned to do other things like earning a living and stuff like that. <laughs> and also, I'd moved, and this was 1980, uh, traumatically, as it were, from Lancashire across to Yorkshire over the Pennines. Um, and I had to sort of rethink uh, my political history landscape and geography. And I wanted to write, arriving in Yorkshire, the history of the women's suffrage movement in Yorkshire. It's going to be easy. Of course it's going to be easy. Um, it hadn't proved too difficult in Lancashire and Manchester. We, Jill and I had been able to do it fairly swiftly. But Yorkshire proved quite difficult. Uh, I arrived and I, I was told about a suffragette from Leeds called Leonora Cohen. And she'd lived to a remarkable 105. But sadly, aged 105, she died two years before I arrived in Yorkshire in 1978. So I never got to meet her, um, though I know a little bit about her. Um, we knew about uh, suffragists like Isabella Ford from Leeds, a Quaker and an ILP socialist and suffragist. And we knew about um, artists like Florence Lockwood from the Colne Valley, a suffragist um, who, here is a, a sketch of where she lived in uh, Linthwaite in Colne Valley uh, from 1903. So let's just look at Florence Lockwood for a moment and compare her with Selina Cooper. Selina Cooper had the, just the most rudimentary of elementary education. Florence came from a much more middle-class family, and she'd actually been to art school. She'd been to the Slade and lived in a flat in London, and had subsequently written her autobiography, An Ordinary Life. I'll pop the title up there, which, though out of print, I managed to um, look at a library copy, and it includes her wonderful um, paintings and sketches. So, Leonora Cohen, um, Isabella Ford, uh, Florence Lockwood, little bits here and there, but unlike the Lancashire cotton towns, the Yorkshire textile towns were so varied. Bradford said, oh, we do worsted and we don't do anything else. And other towns said, well, we do um, wool, but we do it also a little bit of cotton. Um, that there didn't seem to be a pattern or a uniformity um, that you could find in the uh, Lancashire cotton towns where everything was centred on Manchester and the processes in Preston would be the same as uh, in Rochdale, say. So it was very difficult to get a general overview, uh, an over, uh, overview picture. And I, I got despondent about it, and I left this research, and I left Isabella Ford and Florence Lockwood for the best part of a decade, and as I say, went off to do other things, until after the new millennium. And then somehow some good fortune fairy was smiling on me because new archival riches seemed to drop into my lap from about 2002 onwards. Is anyone here from the National Archives? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 2002, the 1901 census was made uh, available and ele electronically searchable. Thank you. So we could learn quite a bit about the early years of some of the little-known Votes for Women campaigners, and we'll come back to the census <coughs> shortly. Then there was a particularly exciting archival discovery, and I'll just cite one, the minutes book of the Huddersfield branch of the WSPU, the Pankhurst Women's and Social and Political Union. The branch secretary had been called Edith Key, and her granddaughter had kept um, the family papers, Edith Key's papers, in a sideboard. A uh, bit of family hoarding going on there. And then, uh, at some point, fairly recently, decided that she ought to deposit them. And in Huddersfield Library, there's very nice uh, Kirkley's archives. So she deposited them, and I could quite quickly go and have a look at this rare and tantalizing glimpse into the life of an early suffragette branch in the north of England. It's a very, very rare to find a suffragette 
minute book. Um, so let's have a look at a sample entry. Dear friends, the members of the Huddersfield Women's Social and Political Union desire me to convey to you an expression of their appreciation of your action and to hope that your health and womanly endurance may enable you to complete your sentences so neither the government or that part of the public still hostile to the just claims of our sex shall find satisfaction in having broken the spirits of our sisters in Holloway Jail. With best wishes, I am yours in the cause, Edith A. Key, Honorary Secretary, and that's the 16th of February, 1908. So, it's written by Edith Key, the Secretary of the branch, to two branch members. Um, I know they're called Ellen Brook and Anne Older, and they're both from the Honley area, not far from Huddersfield. They'd both taken part in the WSPU Suffragette Women's Parliament, and they'd both been imprisoned in Holloway Jail, and they'd both been sentenced to six weeks sentenced to six weeks for asking for the vote. And I think it's a very poignant letter that Edith Key writes, uh, womanly endurance, your health and woman, womanly endurance may enable you to complete your sentence, sentences in the face of that public uh, still hostile. And she's wish, wishing you my best wishes. I am yours in the cause. It was a very uh, dedicated group of primarily working class women in Huddersfield. Um, of whom, in the branch, Edith Key was the secretary. And I think it's quite a poignant uh, letter. Other discoveries I, I, I made was um, Florence Lockwood's uh, wonderful um, banner. This is for the National Union, and it's in the Tulsa Museum, just on the outskirts of uh, Huddersfield. It reminds us of um, the glorious wave of, uh, glorious wave of suffragist banner designing and banner making. And of course, Florence Lockwood with her uh, art um, and landscape. And here is um, a banner uh, evoking the Colne Valley uh, landscape. And I should just mention that David was MP for Colne Valley, so knows the area very, very well. Um, and let's move uh, from Colne Valley to uh, and away from Huddersfield, just for one moment, and look at one final bit of Yorkshire research about Adela Pankhurst. And here she is um, addressing a meeting in Grassington, probably in spring 1910. And I think this photograph vividly evokes the bravery, which David was just referring to, of these, in her case, young campaigners in very remote areas, um, with a lot of men who may not have been sympathetic in the audience. And Adela based herself in Sheffield in South Yorkshire and, as we'll see, became a WSPU organiser for her, um, uh, her mother's uh, suffragette organisation. So piecing together these stories of the suffragists, Isabella Ford and Florence Lockwood, plus the 1901 census data, plus the stories of suffragettes like Adela Pankhurst, the Edith Key manuscript material about the Huddersfield WSPU branch, and including Dora Fulis, uh, baby suffragette, somehow again I managed to persuade Virago to um, uh, accept my proposal uh, for Rebel Girls. And on the uh, cover, they chose... Uh, Dora Fulis, baby suffragette from Huddersfield. Uh, obviously, the colour is their colour, not uh, colour photography. And it just shows what it was like to be a 16-year-old weaver from Huddersfield arrested by these two very tall, um, very disciplined uh, policemen. And that photograph was on the front page of the Daily Mirror. It was made into a postcard. And Dora Fulis came back home famous, notorious, a weaver in a town where most of the manufacturers would be liberal and she went very, very quiet. We didn't hear much about her again. So that was 2006. And surely, surely, there's no more to be discovered about votes for women. Surely. <laughs> well, one of the things we were doing is we were waiting um, for 2012 to come along for the 1911 census to be released.
But thanks to a freedom of information request that I think David's had a hand in getting through Parliament, the National Archives, again, thank you, uh, <laughs> released the census three years earlier. So we got the 1911 census at New Year 2009. And I was joined by fellow suffrage researcher Elizabeth Crawford, and we went down to the National Archives. It was New Year 2009, and the photograph showing us in mid January 2009, swathed in scarves and so many mittens on, it was really, really cold. But we were determined to get to Kew and determined to go and see these archives, which hadn't yet got quite fully accessible um, from our home computers. And we began to explore what the 1911 census schedules could tell us about the suffrage campaigns then in 1911. Because, of course, 1911 was the height of the increasingly bitter relationship between Asquith's Liberal government and the Votes for Women campaigners. It had got bitter. And I think Punch, as always, manages to uh, capture it quite well. Here's Asquith putting... Um, have you ever seen a, a shelf more cobwebby? <laughs> putting one more women's suffrage bill uh, back on the shelf. Um, and he's saying, gentlemen, now you've uh, satisfied your co individual consciences. Let's get back to work. For important things, Lloyd George's National Insurance Bill, very important. But the two could have gone together, possibly. Here's Lloyd George looking, well, a bit foxy. Um, uh, and uh, other members of the cabinet. So that's an indication in a punch cartoon of how delayed and procrastinated and obstructed were the women's suffrage bills that appeared in uh, Parliament. And Asquith himself was an opponent, a, he, opponent of women's suffrage. He personally didn't believe that women should, belonged in polling booths. They belonged at country part, house parties at the weekend looking attractive, but not in politics and he made sure that that remained the case. So procrastination on women's suffrage bills, plus for nine months by uh, the, time of the, uh, time of the time of the census, forcible feeding in, um, in prison of hunger-striking suffragettes, and the government came under a lot of uh, uh, barracking and criticism for that, accusations of not only hypocrisy, but government torture, government torture of women who are merely asking for the vote that was enjoyed by two-thirds of men then. So this is the context in which the 1911 census was to be taken by Asquith's Liberal government. And it was to be census night, was to be Sunday the 2nd of April, 1911. The suffrage movement saw this was coming up and they responded differently. Let's look first at the suffragettes. Um, both the Pankhurst and a, a linked uh, group called the Women's Freedom League, which was also suffragettes, and they proclaimed pithily, no vote, no census. And they incited all women, all unenfranchised, to evade the census. Just duck out of the way of the census enumerator when he came. And uh, they were able to use uh, cartoons. Here's the WSPU weekly paper, Votes for Women, and here we have the key cabinet member, John Burns, a working class member, or a rare working class member of the Liberal, Asquith's Liberal cabinet, here in his official regalia saying, no, you can't have the vote to woman. And here, honest John Burns, running the census as operation as president of the local government board, down on his knee in his workman's suit, said, but please fill in your census. Um, and Votes for Women was exposing what they saw as the uh, government, liberal government hypocrisy. So who did boycott the census? Well, let's go to the best-known uh, evader, Emily Wilding Davison. She's a sole occupant of this rather large building, and you probably can't quite see at all, can you, who fills in her and signs her census <coughs> form. Uh, he's called Percy Ryder. He's clerk of works, the House of Commons, and she was found in a cupboard. And she remains the best known of the, of the evaders because she was in this cupboard. And it's, I'm going to get lost exactly where it is. It's somewhere down there, Murray. Um, and wasn't found um, until uh, Monday morning. Um, uh, up 
Whitehall, along the Strand, we get to the Aldwych skating rink, roller skating rink, very fashionable, very fashionable. And the suffragettes had booked this hall for the night of uh, the 2nd, 3rd of April. And here is the largest mass evasion. We can see some of the 570 evaders listening to a suffragette actress reciting um, the biggest of the mass evasions on census night. Let's leave London and head back north to revisit Adela Pankhurst. Uh, she had a mass evasion in Sheffield in her house with the fellow suffragette she shared the house with. And in this, can you see the figures at all? Is that at all legible or is it a blur? It's three men evading, 54 women, so 57 evaders, including a newspaper reporter. And in the book and you've got some leaflets about it, the newspaper reporter, luckily, is a very witty newspaper reporter, and he reports accurately and wittily in the middle of the night, so what can be better? Uh, the registrar on this case signs the schedule because he knows that Adela Pankhurst is going to be evading. He knows this is important. He knows he's going to get no information. NK is don't, not known, so he signs it. Um... Meanwhile, of course, on the other wing of the Votes Women campaign, the National Union, the suffragists, comply. They argue, was really ducking around in darkened streets in Sheffield or London really the most persuasive tactic for trying to persuade the public or politicians to support the next suffrage, women's suffrage bill that was chugging its way through the House of Commons. They thought not. Women must retain their dignity. To persuade the public and polit politicians, they must act in dignified fashion. So let's have a look at the census schedule of uh, Selina Cooper, now a national union organiser. And I don't know whether you can see, but it says um, Selina Cooper, her husband Robert is a weaver, Selina um, has been married 14 years. Uh, Mary is 11 years old. And here are the new questions, new to the 1911 census, and we can perhaps discuss those in discussion, that uh, Selina is uh, asked to provide information that she's given uh, two children who have been born alive. One is alive still, that's Mary, age 11, and one, who we know was her son, um, born first, has died. So let's come back to that in... in uh, discussion and that information um, the census uh, uh, committee and John Burns the minister felt was essential for Lloyd George's health and welfare reforms so um, I put all this together for vanishing for the vote about the census boycott and asked the question who won the vote for who won the battle for the 1911 census so, uh, John Burns stands up in the House of Commons on the Wednesday, it's uh, question time, and he's asked questions, of course, about the census. And he says, and he's quite a bay and quite confident as a Liberal Minister of the government, I do not anticipate that the suffragette agitation against the census will have any appreciable effect upon the accuracy of the statistics of population. Cheers from the members. According to the information that has reached me up to the present, the numbers of individuals who have evaded being enumerated is altogether negligible. Cheers. Um, so he, was he right? I mean, certainly his civil servants in the uh, local government board ran a very impressive operation. Administrati administratively, it was very, very slick. Um, and they were able to enumerate most people, the vast majority of people in the country. They didn't get everybody's names, they didn't get everybody's occupations, uh, Della Pankhurst, um, etc., etc. Emily Wilding Davison's occupations weren't recorded. But for the vast bulk of the population, it was very accurate and an impressive operation. So, did John Burns win the battle for the census? Well, yes, but also no, because. Capturing the public imagination, um, and the next slide shows this, is uh, the suffragettes with their plans to evade. This is a commercial postcard uh, from spring uh, 1911. And don't know whether you can see 
Uh, usually suffragettes are caricatured as wearing glasses and having pointy noses. But these are sort of rather endearing suffragettes who have got their banners, but they're, they're going away in as fashionable a manner of transport as roller skating. skating. They're evading the census in a balloon. I haven't yet found anybody who did, but it's a lovely way of conveying visually uh, in a commercial postcard that the, the, the suffragettes were going to evade the census. And this takes us back to where we started, which was the film, which I think quite a few people had seen. Um, it was 2015. It's set in the uh, East End, and it, it sent us around on the story of Maud Watts uh, right here, who's a laundress. Um, and it's very dramatic. Um, it's very compelling for anybody who doesn't know too much about women's suffrage. It's really worth going to see because you will see what forcible feeding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, was like, what they were up against. It has some queries. It prompts some questions. You know, how can you possibly give a film about women, working class women in the east end of London and erase Sylvia Pankhurst, um, particularly given the period it was at, as well as er erasing all the suffragists? but it does, ca it does capture and compel. So what I want to do in the final slide is just draw everything together um, and to end up with the questions um, uh, of what do uh, women or what do suffrage historians do in the archives. For one hand tied behind us, we, Jill Norris and I started with a question. Who else campaigned for votes for women in Manchester what did they do? And this took us into Manchester Central Reference Library and then up to visit the daughters of suff radical suffragists like Mary Cooper. So start with a question, move to the archives. Selina Cooper biography, uh, 1984. I started with the Mary Cooper papers, um, which uh, Mary was very generously giving to me, and I was staggering up St. Mary Street carrying these voluminous, uh, bulging uh, carrier bags. And that then allowed me to ask other questions. What did radical suffragists do after the First World War? Um, then with Rebel Girls, um, 2006, I started with a question. If that's what's happened in the cotton towns of Lancashire and in Manchester, what was it like in Yorkshire? What was the Yorkshire story? It took a long time to wait, right into the new millennium, and for archive treasures to drop into my lap. Um, to begin to explore uh, and document that story. And it was a story that included both the suffragists, like Flora, uh, Florence Lockwood and Isabella Ford, and suffragettes like um, Leonora Cohen and Dora Thewlis and Edith Key. And finally, with Vanishing for the Vote, which came out two years ago, that was prompted by the early release, uh, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act um, request, to look at the census, so it was very much archive-led, and that prompted me then to ask the question, well, who supported the boycott? Uh, did suffragists all act differently from suffragettes? And who won the battle for the census? So just to end on uh, where we are now, 2016, and in two years' time, uh, thanks to Mari, who's very much coordinating this, we're going to be celebrating in Vote 100 the centenary of women over 30 uh, winning the vote, which was uh, 1918. So in 2018, we should have a really uh, brilliant celebration, both in central buildings like this in the southeast of England, but also out where people live in uh, other areas of England and other areas of the British uh, of, of Britain. So that draws together, I think, everything I wanted to say about archives and history.